Today's show is brought to you in part by support from Science Sandbox, an initiative of the Simons Foundation. In appreciation of our guests' participation, we have made a contribution to the following organization on their behalf. Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, increasing equitable and sustainable use of vaccines in the world's poorest countries. For more information, please visit gavi.org. So I don't think we can stop pandemics in the future unless we actually have vaccines that have been developed way in advance for which we vaccinate the world in anticipating a new flu virus, but this time a flu virus vaccine that can take on any number of new flu viruses that emerge. So they're already, you're already protected. You, know, you already have the sprinkler system in your house before the fire ever starts. And if we could build that kind of technology and support it would be no different than providing fresh and clean, safe water, you know, fresh and clean, safe air. By providing these vaccines, you could stop the problem from ever occurring. So we need to have that vision. Dime, por qué será? Dime, por dónde vas? Dime, de dónde somos? Dime, dime, y dime. Welcome to Sync for Science, the show where musicians and scientists talk about music and science. I'm your host, Matt White. Each week, we'll talk about a song by our guest artist and how it connects with our guest scientist's area of expertise. This week, we'll be speaking with Swedish-Argentine singer-songwriter Jose Gonzalez. Jose's song, El Invento, is the first he's written in Spanish that's been released publicly in his almost 20 years of making records. When his career first took off in 2003, Jose was studying to get his PhD in biochemistry at the University of Gothenburg, making him an already well-informed guest for today's topic. Also joining us is renowned epidemiologist and director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy, Dr. Mike Osterholm. Dr. Osterholm has been one of the most prominent American voices during the coronavirus pandemic and was appointed to President Joe Biden's COVID-19 advisory board. The title of this week's episode on the podcast is El Invento, Designing the Response to a Global Pandemic. Hello, Jose and Mike. Thanks for coming on the show. Hey, great to be here. Thank you. It's a real honor. So, Jose, I'd like to begin by asking you about your sound because it's so distinctive. And I know that as a musician that singing and playing quietly can often sound effortless, but that it's a very difficult thing to do. So I want to know, is that something you had to work at or is it part of your natural ability as a musician? Sure. Uh, well, it's it's been a journey. So I... I mean, I was uh, screaming and playing bass when I was younger, <laughs> mm. but uh, parallel to those bands, I was also very inspired by uh, Silvio Rodriguez, John Gilberto, later Chet Baker, all these soft singing <laughs> artists. And especially, I guess, uh, Chet and John Gilberto were, uh, it was part of their thing to, to sing very quietly and close to the mic. And I, I really enjoyed the recordings they were doing with only one vocal and maybe one or two instruments. So in that sense, it's, uh, it's a sound that I think people like. So in that sense, it's easy. But of course, as soon as you start playing for other people in a room or a, mm. or a stage, it's r really difficult. So it's been a journey to try to figure out how to make that sound good. And, and uh, it's a lot of um, hanging out with sound engineers and talking frequencies and <laughs> By now, it's it sort of works in most venues, but uh, yeah, every three shows you have to struggle with feedback frequencies. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you know, Zhao's uh, father, I think, discouraged him from pursuing a career in music because when he heard him practicing, he said, "You're never going to make it. You don't sing with vibrato. Oh. You know, um, <laughs> you sing too quietly. There's no expressiveness in your voice." Well, he was probably right, but maybe uh, one or two decades before <laughs> John Gilberto. For, for sure. <laughs> then recording techniques came and, and also PAs. And so now, now it works. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Your singing and guitar playing, I think they both have a gentleness that complement each other so well. And I would encourage people to check out the video because it's so beautiful. I found it incredibly life affirming. Yeah, yeah, you should check it out. It's, uh, it's me. And my little family, my, my girlfriend and my daughter in our summer house, uh, where I wrote and recorded the, the most of the album. And uh, yeah, it's a very simple video. But but yeah, the, the the song in itself is also simple, but but classic, I would say. So 
it's got a classic chord progression and uh, in a way it, it's very much inspired by Silvio Rodriguez uh, mm. and his finger picking style or, and, or Paul Simon th- okay. those type of uh, writers yeah and I would like to point out that the English translation stands on its own which is a rare thing and you know I mean since you're a fan of Brazilian music if you've ever heard Jobim's Waters of March in English you know what I'm talking mm. about yeah yeah that's a great one <laughs> it's a great one but not so great in English um, oh, oh, okay. That was your point. <laughs> yeah. So I'd like to ask you about the lyrics because you are, you're not afraid to ask some of the bigger existential questions, like where do we come from mm-hmm. and where are we headed? And the song's title itself, the invention refers to the stories that we tell to answer those questions. So yeah. I wanted to ask, could, could you take a stab at sharing your own point of view about what the song asks? Yeah. So the, the, the questions are, um, where are we from, where are we going, and and why? Questions that everyone might ask themselves sometimes during their lives, and every culture ha- have asked themselves these existential questions. Uh, I think I share the sort of scientific, humanistic worldview with lots of people listening to this, probably. <laughs> But, but around the world, most cultures have uh, supernatural details in their, in their answers. That's why I put the title El Invento. So many times you just come up with inventions to, to these questions. To me, it's uh, obvious that some questions are even the type of questions that we can ask as smart apes, but doesn't necessarily mean that it's a, it's a good question. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Asking why... Uh, sort of uh, needs us to uh, assume that there is an agent that mm-hmm. puts reasons into our lives. But uh, sharing the secular humanistic worldview, I think we sort of have to come up with our own answers to those type of questions. And uh, also it's many times more productive to ask how. So how do we, did we evolve how, from other species? How uh, did the universe come about? How can we move forward? But, but of course, as humans, we can, we can start to ask why. So, so mm-hmm. once we start looking forward, we can shape our future. And that's uh, one of the themes of the album with, with uh, El Invento and, and a couple of other mm-hmm. songs. But even as a secular human, I want to know what your outlook is on the enigma of the universe. The why. Yeah, okay. So, so I'm very excited about the questions that are unanswered and the amazing amount of questions that we don't even haven't even asked yet. (laughs) So the why of the the universe is, as I was mentioning, is it's maybe it's uh, the wrong type of question. It's uh, it's how Mm -hmm. (laughs) you can portion it out in many how questions. Mm -hmm. How did it start? How did it evolve? How did complex life evolve? So that's how I like to approach these type of questions, which are interesting questions. I don't want to say that they're silly or anything. But, but yeah, so I, I really enjoy listening to people that talk about the, the multiverse, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> the electrons that have different spins, but through quantum mechanics seem to connect to each other in a weird way in, in huge distances. And I can only sort of listen to these experts mm-hmm. and remain agnostic. <laughs> yeah, well, it's getting pretty far out, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, so there are details that are just like, I, I can't decide if I'm going to believe this or not. <laughs> and... Um... As it concerns your background in the sciences, do you feel as though through studying biochemistry, the, which is about the building blocks of life, has that put you in a better position to contemplate these questions? Or do the questions just become more confounding as a result? Uh, the word confounding? What? Perplexing, yeah. Perplexing. <laughs> by, by having studied biochemistry and viruses, uh, biochemistry five years and bi- uh, viruses just one year. I think I can uh, handle much of the details, but of course there's <laughs> huge areas of, <laughs> what do you say, the, the opposite of knowledge. <laughs> so I've, I've had, it was 20 years ago that I started, so a, a lot of it has changed, and of course I didn't learn that much that you can learn, but it, it did make, make it super interesting when the, around February, March in 2020, the pandemic was yep. started to get noticed. I just spent one or two months delaying my album <laughs> just to read and listen to, to experts, mm. as yeah. I'm sure many people did as they were in their homes, uh, especially in, in countries where they had lockdowns. Mm-hmm. 
but but yeah so i'm looking forward to to talk to you mike and and hear what <laughs> you have to say i, I listened to your um, podcast the update so i'm i'm really looking forward to to hear more <laughs> Thank you. Well, Mike, how would you best describe your role as both scientist and public figure during the coronavirus pandemic? Well, first of all, let me just begin by saying what an honor it is to be here. And I have to tell you, Jose, I've had more people ask me if I have done this particular session with you yet than have asked if I've met the president of the United States. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> you have many, many fans in my world, in my spin out there, oh, so wow. uh, mm -hmm. and, and rightfully so deserved. In terms of uh, your question, Matt, you know, I've been thinking about pandemics for a long time. <laughs> I've written about them. My 2017 book, Deadliest Enemies, predicted pandemics would be coming, that they would last a, a substantial period of time. They would inflict pain, suffering, and death, unlike where I had previously experienced. And uh, that's not ever a good message that people want to hear. So it's easy to block it out. And in fact, I think one of the telltale moments of my uh, early days in the pandemic was on March 10th of 2020. I was actually on the Joe Rogan podcast that day talking about this issue. And I said that we easily could see 480,000 deaths in the United States and that this could last more than 18 months. And you can't know the blowback I got at that point. You know, <laughs> somebody who was just scaring the hell out of people needlessly. and They're just you know, this was not going to happen. And of course, you now know, I have obviously underestimated the impact. To a certain extent, you know, it's understandable because no one had a frame of reference for this. It had not happened in anyone's lifetime. However, you saw this coming in 2005. You saw yeah. this, you talked about it in your book at great length in 2017. So what did you see in the data that tipped you off that this was going to happen? You know... <laughs> It'd be like if I asked you, if an apple comes loose from a tree, which way is it going to go? Mm -hmm. You'd say, well, down. And I'd say, where's your data? You know, and you'd say, well, I don't have any data. It's gravity. You know, I think just in understanding pandemics and the historic nature of them through all of time, it was just inevitable. We're going to see more. And so that the challenge is now we have it overlaid on a modern world with all of its interlinked supply chains and crowded mega cities and lack of adequate health care in so many parts of the world. So in some ways, all I did is took a proposition that was equally you know, true 200 years ago and put it into a modern world context and said, this is what we're going to be up against. Um, a good example would be if that apple falls from the tree in a very calm day, you could predict where it's going. On the other hand, if that apple falls off the tree in a Category 5 hurricane, mm -hmm. you're not sure where it's going to land. But you know it's going to land eventually. You know, if, if we're to understand that a virus's evolution is seemingly random, how has COVID behaved as a virus that you found surprising? Well, when you look at evolution, you can say it's random, but it's really not. It's exactly what Jose was talking about earlier, how you connect all these things together. And then there's the big questions. But evolution's been working since the very first chemicals on the face of what was this emerging Earth started to combine together and then they formed uh, other chemicals. Yeah, and I think that ultimately they formed a life. And then life became much more complicated through all of the history. And I think sometimes that's hard to imagine that life began many, 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 many years before the Grand Canyon was ever begun to be formed. And so evolution is the powerful driver here. It's, you might say it's like gravity. If you had to think of two things in the world right now that would really drive us, it's, it's gravity and it's evolution. And uh, so I think in that regard, it's doing what it does. It's done in a very short period of time. We're talking 18 to 24 months when we're talking about from a standpoint of the Earth's history. That, that's not even one pebble of sand on a huge, huge beach in time, what's happened so far. But it also shows what microbes can do quickly. You know, you and I talk about a generation of 20 years to 30 years between generations. With microbes, we talk about differences between generation of 20 to 30 minutes. And so they are able to adapt. They're able to mutate. That in many cases is a flaw. It's a fatal. It, it's not to their advantage and they die off. And that's exactly what these variants are. Um, you know, these have been mutated viruses that because they don't have the same machinery to reproduce themselves with the accuracy that, say, human cells can, which even then we still have challenges. That's called cancer. 
the issue is, is that all they have to do is have some successful ones that actually give them some advantage. I have a question now that we're in Omicron times. I was wondering if this will shorten the amount of time that we will have with this pandemic in uh, thinking about the people who don't want to take uh, vaccines and this will sort of boost their immune systems. Yeah, this is one of the really big challenges of predicting the days ahead with this pandemic. Number one is surely Omicron itself is a surge of cases around the world will probably be short lived in the next three to six weeks and we'll see case numbers drop precipitously. The challenge is what happens after that. And it won't go away. It'll stay around. How many cases will occur is unclear. I think the really big challenge is what's the next variant. There could easily be a variant that could develop that is much more evasive to the current immunity from our vaccines and from Omicron and Delta. If that were to happen, it'd be kind of like starting the clock all over again. Mm. So that's what we don't know. And that's obviously not what anybody wants to hear. But the reality is, if you look back a year ago today, at that time, we had Alpha had emerged out of the United Kingdom. Beta and Gamma were coming out of South Africa and South America. And people were saying, oh, but never mind, it's going to be over with. And then we saw what happened with Delta showed up and now Omicron. And the big question is, what's the next one? Yeah. And I think it will happen. There will be a next one. It could be milder and could be the fact that current vaccine immunity and previous infection immunity will protect you. We just don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, Omicron is, in fact, causing more mild illness, right? It is. But the proportion of people having severe illness is lower. But the numbers are so much larger of who's getting infected that we're still offsetting healthcare. I mean, right now on our East Coast, our healthcare system's in, in break mode. Is there anything to suggest that because the infections are, are more mild with this variant that that suggests that that will continue to happen? It will we get, don't know that. You don't? We don't know that. That's the problem. could turn out that if you evade immune protection, they could be really very severe again. I mean, one of the reasons why we're seeing the limited number of severe illnesses per population is the fact that people have pre-existing immunity that is surely having some positive impact on that disease picture. Uh, we don't know that the next variant would necessarily make that have that same thing happen. I'm uh, I'm very curious. I'm thinking about competition between these different strains. One goes through the exponential spreading. Does it crowd out the other strains? Yeah. In this case, Delta is going to be gone. I think within weeks. I think it will crowd it out. The question is, does that mean that Omicron is a permanent king of the virus hill, or just another? part-time holder. If we had another variant that actually had really immune evasive aspects to it, it could in fact defeat Omicron because it would infect people who were previously infected by Omicron and thought to be protected against COVID-19 when they're not. Hmm. So Omicron, it seems to be getting more in the upper uh, respiratory. Yep, it does. Uh, but then we, we don't know anything about lung COVID or Omicron. Don't we don't. We know very little about long COVID, which particularly in kids right now is a big question. Uh, oh, OK. We're seeing a lot of cases of, of Omicron in kids in the United States. Our pediatric hospitals in the East Coast right now are filled. Yeah, that's huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have your opinions about the effectiveness of the vaccine changed at all? Well, we've learned a lot more about the vaccine. They are remarkable tools, but they're not perfect. One of the things that we've learned has been the fact that the waning immunity that we see with individuals who are vaccinated is surely a challenge. And I think the real question is, is that if we have to go back and boost people, give them additional doses every six months, as it's been suggested right now, for example, in Israel, that's not going to fly globally. We can't even get the world vaccinated once right now in many countries. Imagine trying to vaccinate everybody every six months. Uh, you know, while they're working, they're working well. But when they start to wane, what are we going to do about that? Yeah. What's your prediction as to how this is going to play out? Um, I think the next three to four weeks are going to be a huge challenge, a mm -hmm. huge challenge. Uh, we're going to see more and more of our infrastructures challenged. Healthcare workers are off sick. We won't be able to have testing in any meaningful way because of the fact that so many people themselves will be sick who are conducting the, the testing sites. 
We're going to see supplies that need for laboratory testing are going to be in short supply. We're even seeing right now outbreaks in laboratories that are doing the testing so that they themselves, again, are not able to do it. Uh, we're going to see compromise to a lot of our basic and critical infrastructures, fire, police. Uh, we have reports today on the East Coast of a number of police and fire departments with more than 35 percent of the workforce out even now when they are already short-staffed to begin with. Uh, we're seeing pharmacies that are closed because they don't have enough pharmacists or technicians to, to keep them open. Uh, the drugs are not making it from the warehouse because the warehouse workers, the truck drivers bringing the drugs to the local pharmacies are out because they're sick. Food supplies are down. It's been very hard to move food. We're seeing products right now that can't be brought to market because they don't have any packaging because the printing companies are down. That's going to continue to build over the course of the next several weeks. I mean, what are two plausible scenarios of what things will look like in 12 months? One is that basically this is the last of the big surge thrust. Uh, we get back to more of everyday life like people thought we were last June and July early. Then, and that's on a global basis. Or we could see another variant emerge that could be highly infectious and one that can evade the immune protection of our current immunity from vaccines or natural infection. And that one could be a, a, a dilly. I mean, that one could really, again, disrupt everything we are doing as a everyday life world, just because of the fact that so many people will be very sick and need hospitalization again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was wondering if uh, Omicron uh, seems to be less uh, lethal and less severe, how how do you envision a way forward if we don't get other strains in terms of uh, staying home uh, if, if you have a sneeze? Or well, I, I think we're going to have a, a really major impact on the disease with the combined vaccines treatments. Don't forget that back in 1981, 82, if we were having this discussion about HIV AIDS, that was a death sentence disease. And today it's largely a chronic disease we're able to treat quite effectively with therapeutics. I think on a worldwide basis, what's going to happen is we still want people to be vaccinated and protected against ever getting infected or specifically protect them against severe illness. But if we could make a globally available these new medicines that are coming that are highly effective in reducing one's likelihood of having severe disease, won't prevent you from getting infected necessarily, but if you do get infected and we can quickly detect that with lab testing and give you this drug, we can do to COVID what we did to HIV in those areas where drugs are readily available. So I think that we do have the tools that we can really expand upon how we respond to COVID, and I think that could have a really big impact. And do you think that it could keep resurging over 5, 10, 20 years? Could. We don't know. I mean, new variants, what's going to happen? We now know there are many animals in the animal kingdom that are getting infected with this virus. In the United States, we just did some groundbreaking work showing uh, the level of this virus in white-tailed deer in areas throughout the entire country. What happened? We don't know why they got infected. And it's clearly the human viruses they're getting infected with. Well, is that a breeding ground for a new virus to mutate out and to create, cause a new variant? Could be. I mean, this virus is going to have ample opportunities, whether it's in humans or other animals right now, to, in fact, continue to change and potentially present with one of those mutations that we'd be most worried about. Oh, my God. When, when I was studying uh, herpes viruses, uh, we were comparing the whole family of viruses, but not only in humans, uh -huh. but all different kinds of animals. So you can get a better glimpse of which sequences are conserved. And um, that's exactly right. So in a way, once a very potent virus is out of the box, it is a new world for it. It's hard. You can't put the genie back in the bottle once it's out. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you have to live with it. So I guess we're talking about the fifth endemic coronavirus or? Could be. We don't know. I think part of it is last spring, we had this sense of exuberance where we had one. It was us over the virus, independence from COVID. And I think that if we learned any lesson the hard way is do not underestimate this opponent. And if, in fact, it's put the potential for a new variant to emerge is real, then we have to be prepared mm -hmm. for that. Hopefully it'll never happen. But as I've said time and time again, hope is not a strategy. OK, 
we we got to be prepared for it. And that's what we're really uh, addressing right now is just saying we've got to deal with the immediate pandemic issue we have on hand. But what happens if a new variant emerges three to six months from now? What have we done to develop what we call pan-coronavirus vaccines, vaccines that could really target specific regions of the viruses that it doesn't change much? Would that help? And so that we might develop immunity to parts of the virus that aren't going to mutate. Therefore, no matter which variant gets thrown at us, we'll have more protection. What is it that enhances the immune response? One of the challenges we've seen with coronaviruses is that they tend not to be good long-term immunogens or you know, uh, agents that are capable of eliciting a human response that's durable. You know, when I get vaccinated for measles or I have measles, that protection is durable for decades and decades. With coronavirus infections, sometimes it's just a year or two. What can I do to enhance that? So we've got a lot of work to do, but each one of these offers an opportunity so that we can take COVID off the table as the immediate pandemic threat. Mm -hmm. I think we could imagine many worse scenarios than this one. So I'm not saying that this is an easy one. I'm just thinking of uh, the scenarios that I've heard through uh, the effective altruism movement that, that are concerned with the catastrophic global threats and existential threats where they not only talk about natural occurring viruses, but also synthetic engineered, engineered ones, ones uh, synthetic biology, gain of function research. Mm -hmm. What people have to understand is today, and I think you're, your reference to the gain of function or research obviously is at the forefront of the big debate of where this virus come from. But I think that's a big challenge. And this is something I've been involved with for almost 20 years. Is Excuse me, could you define gain of function for us, Mike? Gain of function is where we intentionally manipulate a microbe in a way that increases its ability to be transmitted or cause more serious disease or evade treatment even. And uh, we've been very concerned about that dating back to the post-World War II bio-warfare work that the Russians and the Americans first embarked upon. The U.S. given up its programs in the late 60s, but the Russians kept right up doing this kind of work until the fall of the USSR. And uh, it was clear that at that time, the tools we had to make these bugs worse were more limited. Today, Someone in a high school microbiology laboratory can do what only the most top, well-funded, secret work of scientists and government programs could do 20 years ago. It's amazing. Mm. And so we're getting uh, to the point now where we have to be mindful of what else we could do to make these bugs worse. Imagine if we could create Godzilla today. Unfortunately, we really are getting to the point where we can do that. So that's another thing we have to be mindful of. Mm -hmm. You know, you talked about high school kids having much more sophisticated technology at their fingertips. Do you, and as I understand it, enhancing a virus or making it more deadly involves some amount of gene splicing. Do you see a day in our lifetime where high school kids will have CRISPR, basically, to work with and where that they could be, you know, creating something like a, a far more deadly pandemic? Well, I, I don't want to sound glib on this, but uh, one day CRISPR will look like those original uh, mobile phones look like the size of walkie-talkies. Mm. I mean, that's how fast technology is changing. And, you know, CRISPR is a, a very, very powerful tool. And today it is a state of the art. But this is what technology development is all about. Think about today, your, your mobile phone today of your mobile phone versus 10 years ago and see how much has changed. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what we're concerned about is how do you regulate that? Because we don't want to stop or slow down the work that is helping a society. What more can we learn in a way that would provide better treatments, more effective vaccines, or better understanding this? I got very involved with this uh, in, in a major way back in 2012. Uh, from 2005 to 2014, I served on the National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity. It's a federal organization here in the United States that was set up to deal with this very issue of how do you oversee gain-of-function work? How do you oversee lab safety? And we have thousands of laboratory accidents that occur literally every year around the world where something accidentally, nobody intentionally means to do it, these are Workers get actually infected by what they're working with. Uh, somehow there's a gap in, in the safety issues around the ventilation. If something gets out. And so our job was to really look at this. And in 2012, we had two different research groups 
that had taken H5N1 influenza virus, the bird flu virus, as it was called, and were looking to see how will we know if this is getting close to becoming the next pandemic strain. So what they wanted to do, which they started to do, was to pass it in ferrets, an, a mammal like us. And what over time was happening is they would get it closer to closer where it could readily transmit between ferrets. And they thought, once we have that, we'll be able to know what that virus looks like. And then we'll know if it's going to likely be out in the wild and in fact, potentially infecting humans. But what everybody forgot to think about was, wow, what if that virus gets out though from your laboratory? What could go wrong? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think that this is an important area that we still have ethical and logistical issues to deal with. So how do you not hold back that science that can save lives, that can really make the world a better place versus that which is a dark science, even if not intended, if it's even accidental, mm -hmm. what, what are the implications? Mm -hmm. What's a typical day at the office look like? I mean, would you ever, would threats come across your, your desk? I mean, we're talking about accidental leaks here. What about where there are actual bad actors involved? We haven't seen anything like that. I mean, the threats that people like myself and others have had to deal with are just death threats because of the work we're doing. I mean, I have to say it has become a very toxic world to work in this area and the politics have played out, you know. One of my close colleagues and dear friends is Tony Fauci. And, uh, you know, I, I have a longstanding 40-year relationship with him, and it's uh, one of the people who I consider to be a true hero in our modern society. And, you know, we all are under tremendous pressure today because of the political ideology issues around what this all meant and what happened. Politically, we are less able to respond to a pandemic today than we've ever been. Yeah. The division that occurs in our body politic is such that, you know, we would much rather take each other on than take on the virus. I know. If, if we've been on this every hundred year timetable, is that going to accelerate? Like, do you think we might see? It is. It is going to. Yeah, it is. We're going to see more and more of these pop up. In our lifetime, you think? Yeah. This is a calculus problem. Rate of speed increases. Compound interest. That's what this is. Can I, can I ask a question that's not about uh, COVID or Corona? Please. I'm, sure. I'm thinking about um, uh, lessons learned from this pandemic moving forward in a global interconnected age, 8 billion going towards 10 billion. Yeah, I think, I think the, the, the interaction between animals and humans is an important one. If you look at those viruses, that have emerged as pandemic viruses. Whether you look at influenza, you look at HIV, you look at SARS, you know, whether it be the original SARS virus, the MERS virus in the Middle East, now the COVID issue, SARS-2. One of the things that's front and center is how often it's human-animal contact. Well, to feed, you know, additional billions of people on the earth as opposed to 100 years ago, the food systems are very different, both in terms of of, ag of agriculture, but also in terms of hunting. And so many places in the world that uh, at one time, you know, were isolated areas where viruses might flourish in certain animal species. Now humans are interacting in those areas. And so we have to be mindful of, yes, as more people are on the face of the earth, the greater the likelihood that there'll be a spillover event, meaning someone getting infected. And once the spills over, it doesn't matter if you have 7,000 people, 7 million people or 7 billion people, it'll spread through everyone. Mm. You know, right now we estimate that there are somewhere right around 38 billion chickens on the face of the earth on any one given day, 38 billion. Today, from the time a chicken is hatched until it's often chicken breast on your plate is only 45 days. It's the fastest conversion of, of energy to protein that we have. Well, half of all the weight of birds in the world is now chicken, half of all the weight of a bird. And it's because we need that to feed the 8 billion people on the face of the earth. But that's also the source where these influenza viruses, these bird viruses that reside in the chicken that don't typically infect humans, don't cause a problem. But you know what? They're, right now, if we look at it, there are about 290 million pigs on the face of the earth. And they often are co-located near chickens because it's all part of the food system. Well, pigs have the unique ability in their lungs to get infected by both bird viruses and human viruses. Mm. They're one of those unique animals. So, so if you get a human virus and a pig lung about the same time, 
watch out. This could be the brand new one. And, you know, we don't understand yet just how much we've increased the risk of these viruses happening. The worst biologic scourge in the history of humankind was smallpox. Last century, despite it being only in limited parts of the world for much of the, of the century and it being eradicated in 1978, 200 million people still died from smallpox in the last century. But vaccines basically wiped it out. And that's what we need to do with today with our vaccine work is basically create that barrier so that pandemics don't even get a start, let alone inflict the major and, and traumatic damage it does to society. How do you create a vaccine for a virus that does not yet exist? We know how the viruses actually enter into cells and how they establish infection. In this case, with the coronavirus, we know about this thing called the spike protein, which is very important for how it attaches to a human cell and then ultimately enters it. Regardless of what coronavirus you're dealing with, if you can basically handle that spike protein, then you, in fact, can create the immunity so you have a broad protective vaccine against coronaviruses. Same thing is true with the influenza virus. Look at influenza as if there's a big broccoli stalk with the base and the big head sticking out of the virus with the stock down inside the virus. That's really important for the influenza virus and in attaching to a human cell again, a lung cell or an animal cell. And one of the reasons why we have to get new flu virus vaccines almost every year is that head of the stock, which is what attaches to the human cell, changes. It's kind of a kaleidoscope. We're working on new vaccines that actually go, for example, after the stock, which is constant. It never changes. And so if we can get that, it won't matter what that head does, however it might change to become a pandemic virus or a seasonally changed virus, we can still create the immunity that in fact will prevent you from getting flu. So that's what we're looking at right now is the more generalized ways of having the immune system function in a new way okay. to actually produce uh, protection as it concerns rates of transmission. How, how do scientists test for that? So, for example, uh, we'll follow up on all the contacts of a case, and particularly among those who are not vaccinated because mm. they surely couldn't get infected. How often mm. does somebody else get infected under these conditions? And then we also are looking at other issues in terms of how much virus an individual has, how much are they putting out, are they only shedding virus for two days or five days? Mm -hmm. Things like that. So that's how we look at the potential for a virus to be more or less of a problem in society. But, but what are the nuts and bolts of gathering those people? I mean, you're not getting someone to sign a waiver to have their face coughed in, right? I mean, you... No. What, uh, first of all, the, the kinds of work that we're doing, and this is what public health does so well, is in terms of following up with cases, for example, to see how many people they infect, they get a list of the names of their contacts. And, and you know, it's not something that's a bad thing. You know, it's mm -hmm. a situation where I'm willing to say, this is who's been in my household with me. This is who I've had contact okay. with in the, in the 72 hours before I got sick. And then we follow up with them to follow to see how many of them get infected. Mm -hmm. And then we may do additional studies to actually get the virus from those who got infected to confirm that, in fact, that source was the source, meaning it's the same virus. So, okay. you know, technically someone could get infected from another person too. So there, there's a whole series of studies that go on like that to understand transmission. I saw a headline the other day that just said, should I just go ahead and get Omicron and, and get it over with? What's your response to that? Well, I'd say three things. First of all, please don't do that because <laughs> you could very well end up in one of our hospitals. And right now our hospitals are overrun. So you know, I often say that if you have a thousand cases of something, what happens to the healthcare system is very different if one of those people presents for the next thousand days or all thousand show up today in the emergency room. Big difference. OK, so we wanted if for no other reason to space those out because they also help us with all the areas of health care. If you're overrun by COVID, you are not responsive necessarily to automobile accidents or people with strokes or heart attacks. The second piece of it is, is that we will have drugs available in the near term, not yet, but don't get infected now and risk the possibility of a severe illness and not have drugs available. Even a few months from now, there's gonna be a much greater supply of these drugs that I talked about 
that could really, really help you out, okay? Finally, you don't want to get it because the challenge is in many of our lives, we do have loved ones who are at risk for serious illness, okay? Yeah, you know, just because uh, mom and dad appear to be healthy, remember they've been treated for cancer and they have an underlying immune deficiency. Uh, you don't want to be the person to transmit to them. So the way you can best guarantee that is don't get infected. And so I think for all these reasons, we want to postpone it at the very least, okay? Then in, in hopefully one day, you'll be able to have a vaccine that will be much more protective than even the ones we have now. But in the meantime, I would not encourage anyone to intentionally get infected. I think Nicholas Christakis mentioned that you don't want an exponential curve to go this way. You want it to go that way. Yep. <laughs> to, so it's back to flatten the curve as uh, everyone was mentioning at the beginning of the pandemic. Yep. That's what we want to do. And uh, to avoid excess deaths. I don't think that point can be hammered home enough. The reason why we have to be so vigilant is as responsibility to the collective, you know? It is. And it starts with our own families and our colleagues and our friends. And uh, I think that's what people often miss is that the universe is large, but the ones we love are right by us. And I've seen far too many examples where families have had major outbreaks in their family because someone basically went and, you know, was involved with some high risk behavior in public settings, mm -hmm. never really told the family, came home, and unbeknownst to that individual and the family, he or she were infected mm -hmm. and look mm -hmm. what happened. So I think that this is a huge yeah. issue. Um, well, we're, we're about out of time. Jose, do you have any other questions for Mike or Mike for Jose? Or I have, I have one question for you. Are you coming out with any new music? <laughs> you got me hooked on your music, <laughs> you. man. I really love it. I, we listen to you. We listen to you a lot. I'm glad you liked it. I love it. I just did a choir version of the first song on the latest album. Uh, and I sang all the vocals myself. So I did four, 40, yeah, fantastic. 40 uh, voices of me. <laughs> wow. I can't oh, wait cool. to hear it. <laughs> Is it out? <laughs> no, no, it's coming out. But uh, <laughs> I was relating to the fact that the choirs uh, seem to be a very, you know, serious way of uh, spreading the virus. But I was sitting home alone. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a great example. That's really good. Uh, so. Well, it's always a, it's a real uh, privilege to talk to you and be with you. I wish I could give you better information. No, it's than my I honor. And uh, I, I, I listen to your podcast, and I'm and uh, I, oh, I, I, maybe I could mention I was preparing for this uh, by listening to the eighty thousand hours podcast, and, yeah. and they did a yeah. couple of really interesting interviews uh, about uh, pandemic preparedness and and also new technologies to mm -hmm. to try to um, yeah measure not only one virus at a time but many. Oh, good. At a time. <laughs> and Mike, what's your the name of your podcast so people know? Just the Ostrom update. Okay, so check that out. And it's real simple. I'm a I'm a simple far, rural Iowa farm guy. You know, very simple. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Be sure to check out Jose's latest album, Local Valley, and catch him on tour this spring. His choral version of El Invento, along with a remix by Sofia Cortices, comes out March 6th. Stay up to date with Dr. Osterholm and all things COVID on his podcast, The Update. Sing for Science is co-produced by TalkHouse and brought to you with support from Science Sandbox, an initiative of the Simons Foundation. Our music is by Panoram, media by Ottavio Media and Bailey Constance, and pressed by TCB Public Relations. Special thanks to Sean Otto, Ken Weinstein, Brian Long, Keith Whitty, and Miriam Konem for their help with today's show. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on your podcast platform of choice and follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Sing for Science. Thanks for listening. <laughs>